Hello and welcome to this short workshop introducing the manufacture of riveted mail. I'm going to talk through the process of making and riveting the rings such as you can see here. The first thing you need is wire. Soft black iron wire that's low carbon, been annealed and is easy to work with is ideal. Don't use galvanised wire, we'll be heating it later on and that can give off toxic fumes. I find 16 to 18 gauge or 1.25 to 1 mil thick is a good size for working with when you start. You can buy small reels from wires.co.uk or you can buy large reels of this from builders, merchants and metal suppliers. Uh, these are 25 kilo rolls and work out much more cost effective for the amounts of mail that I'm making. Once we've got our wire, we need to make it into a spring. And for this, we use a mandrel, basically just a metal rod, the diameter you want for the inside of your rings. I've got a range of different sizes for different styles of mail. The rod has a hole in it, so the wire can be passed through to keep it in place. So to make the spring, we put the wire into the hole and start turning the mandrel. It's interesting to note from his surviving examples that for Roman and earlier mail, the left overlaps the right, whereas for mail made after this period, the right almost always overlaps the left. Once a spring is as long as you need, I usually make it the full length of a mandrel to make a couple of hundred rings at a time. Then you cut the wire and take the mandrel out of the block. To release a spring, tap the wire back out of the hole a bit to make it easier to cut. I've left it a bit short on this example. Once it's tapped out a bit, you can use a pair of side cutters to snip the wire and that allows you to slide the spring off the mandrel. And there we have our completed spring ready for cutting into separate rings. For cutting the rings, we need a specialised tool. This is a pair of side cutters with a notch cutting the blades using a file or a dremel to grind down the blades. The cutting tip and the notch behind it are both the same width as our wire. And this means that when we cut the spring, the cutters skip over the first wire and cut behind it, giving an overlap. This can also be done using a chisel at a 45 degree angle on the spring when it's still on the mandrel, but I find it easier to do it this way. Coiling and cutting the wire will have work hardened it, so we're going to have to soften it again. Traditionally this would have been done by placing the rings back into a forge to anneal the wire again, but I'm going to heat it to red hot and allow it to air cool or normalise it. Not quite as soft as if it was annealed, but fine for what we want. So I'm just heating them up with a gas torch till they're red hot and then let them air cool to soften them up again. And if we didn't do this, then when we came to flatten the rings, the overlaps would just skip off each other. Once the rings are cooled again, they're ready to be flattened. And you can do this in a number of ways, with a hammer or with a piston, such as you can see next to the anvil. Or sometimes what I do is I squeeze the rings between a heavy pair of tongs. What you should end up with is a nicely flattened overlap and a slight D-shape to the ring. The hammering for the overlap will have hardened the metal again, so time to heat it up again to red hot and allow it to cool in order to soften it. The next stage is to drift rivet holes into the rings, and for this we use either round or wedge shape drifts. Early mail has round rivet holes, while the wedge shape was introduced from the 14th century onwards. So the ring is going to be drifted on a drift plate with a couple of taps just to seat the drift into the overlap first of all, before moving over to a hole where the drift is driven through the ring. So you can see the tip of the drift has driven through the metal but it's not punched the metal out. And this is important because it's this excess metal that will merge with the rivet and give the join added strength. So here we have our drifted ring ready now for riveting. So for our round or pin rivets, we take a piece of wire, that's the right diameter for the hole, and we file the end slightly because remember our drift is pointed. We 
place the wire into the hole and push it through so the end comes out just proud of the excess metal on the other side. The wire is snipped off, flush to the overlap, making sure the wire doesn't spring away and fly off. And as you can see here, you should have a short piece of wire poking out both sides of the ring. So I'm taking these pliers that I've modified by drilling a hole in one side and these allow me to push the wire through so that it's flush on the one side. Modern riveted mail has double headed domed rivets but this is not the case with the original mail. To peen the rivet we need to use riveting tongs and this is a set of tongs that is flat on one side and has a small dome and the shape of the overlap in the other. This is a specialist set of tongs but you can make your own out of a set of carpenter's pliers that you just grind the edges off and then drill a small dome shape into one face. So to peen the rivet, place the excess wire into the dome and make so sure that the flat side of your ring is flush against the flat side of the tongs and then simply squeeze. And you should end up with a nicely domed rivet shape that's flat on the other side. For wedge rivets, the rivets are triangular pieces cut from a thin flat strip of iron. From the dome side they can look very similar, but the rectangular strip on the flush side makes them easy to distinguish from the pin riveted mail. Once you've made a few of these, it's time to join them together. And for European 4-in-1 mail, this means joining four rings to a central ring. So we've got our four riveted rings here and we need to link them with our unriveted ring and to do this, we prise the unriveted ring apart and link the riveted rings on. Make sure the dome is facing in one direction for two rings and in the opposite direction for the other two rings. Close the ring back up and then this can be riveted to form a five lit of closed rings. The reason it's important to have two rings facing in one direction and two rings facing in the opposite direction when you link them together is so that when you lay them flat all the domes are facing the same way. The flush side of the rings lies against clothing or padded jackets lying under the mail and this means that the mail won't rip the soft cloth. The working process involves making groups of closed rings which are then linked together into fivelets. The fivelets are joined together into longer chains and then the chains are joined together to make larger sections. As a guide, the rectangular piece here is probably five to six hours work from bare wire and the larger section you can see is several days work in total. While the four-in-one pattern is used for rectangular panels, mail can be tailored to fit the body more closely. I use these wooden rings to test out tailoring techniques before committing to riveted mail where mistakes are more difficult to correct. I'm currently making a mail standard based on a 15th century example from the Wallace collection. You can find out more about my work by following on Instagram. If you want to go yourself, here are some suppliers to get you started. And if you have any questions, please get in touch. Thanks for watching.